Welcome everybody to Wednesday Night Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension Wisconsin 4-H. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, I'm delighted to introduce myself. I get to be the speaker tonight. Every now and then I get to give a talk for two reasons. One, it reminds me how much work it is. And I ask 49 other people a year, at least, to give talks, and it's a great reminder. Two, this is a very special reason. I work here at the Biotech Center, and our Associate Director, Chuck Kaczynski, has started this program called the UWMIA Recovery and Identification Program, um, and its mission is to uh, find, recover, and identify remains of missing in action U.S. soldiers, primarily so far from World War II. So I'm gonna introduce myself. I'm gonna ask myself the five questions. Tom, where were we born? I was born in Dixon, Illinois. And I went to Dixon High School. That's the second question. And then I went to UW Platteville to study biology and got my master's at the University of Illinois in plant pathology. And then I came up here in January of 1982 when it was 27 degrees below zero. Yeah to get my PhD in plant pathology over in beloved Russell Labs. Then I postdoc at agrogenetics, uh, which, is a, which was a plant molecular biology company on the east side of town, uh, sadly no longer there. I was six years at Northern Illinois University, and then I came here on the 1st of June, it was a Saturday, 1991, and I've been here ever since. I got to be a Congressional Science Fellow from 2000 and to 2001, serving on the staff of the House Committee on Agriculture. And I got to write speeches for the director of the National Science Foundation from 2008 to 2010. Yay. They're dancing in the aisles. Ready to go. So this is the, my description of things that I saw and learned and wondered about during this past summer's recovery mission in Belgium, near Bastogne, uh, looking for the remains of a US airman shot down uh, in the latter half of 1944 in Belgium. Now you notice I'm not giving you full details. That's because this is different than the mission that I went on in 2016 when we knew the name of the person we had contacted the family. Well, not we, but Chuck had done all these things. And uh, we could discuss the, the mission in full. This is a little bit different. And so if you, you can ask me whatever questions you want, I may have to say, that's a good question. I can't answer that for you yet. Because um, for this mission, the family of the targeted MIA person does not know that we're looking for that person. So it's a little bit different. So here's the University of Wisconsin Recovery and Identification Program for Missing in Action folks. So this map shows, and this is from the um, Defense POW MIA Accounting uh, Agency, the numbers of folks of US missing in action. And I'm gonna get a larger view of this. So down below, you'll see from World War II, there are about 72,000 missing in action from the Korean War, 7,500, Vietnam, nearly 1,600, the Cold War, 126, um, the Gulf War is five, and the El Dorado Canyon, one. The focus of the MIA program has been in Europe for World War II. But I think they're also working on other possibilities. Um, the first four recoveries have been for land-based missions. There's also the possibility of doing sea-based missions. If you remember here, this number right here, over 41,000 of the missing are presumed lost at sea. So that would be a very big advance if we could find technologies or develop technologies that help locate the possible remains of people um, in water. And thank you for giving me this. This is an article um, 
from the latest issue of Science. There's an article in here on environmental DNA from uh, ocean-based samples with the idea of trying to figure out how well human remains can be detected or human DNA can be detected from uh, ocean waters. So this is a tweet from uh, Veterans Day last year, and it emphasizes this overall number of 82,000 US uh, service members still missing in action. 41,000 of those are gonna are missing at sea. Um, and there's about, well, I'll, I'll wait to say the number because it's up coming up on the screen. The big deal for us here in Wisconsin is that more than 1,500 of these are from Wisconsin. For context, how big is 82,000 people? So one Lambeau Field, one Camp Randall Stadium. That's a lot, a lot of people. We've been doing Wednesday night at the labs uh, from the very early days of the program. The first mission, which was done at the initiative of, the, of a friend of the family of the missing person, Private Gordon um, consisted of not so much finding remains as it was, we have this box of remains in an ossuary and it's a German ossuary. And part of the puzzle of this is that an American soldier, or rather I should say, a Canadian citizen who signed up and served in the US Army and who was killed in August of 1944 in France, after he was killed, there was a mix up in the remains and somehow his remains ended up in a German ossuary. And the family members were able to help trace that back. They came to the biotech center because of DNA technology. And because of that DNA technology and because of Chuck's skill in being able to work with the United States Department of Defense, the government of France, the government of Germany, and the government of Canada, they were able to sleuth this out, get permission to get a sample from the bones in the box that contained supposedly this unknown, confirm that it was in fact the remain using DNA, that it was in fact the remains of Private Gordon. And that meant that with the cooperation of those four countries, United States, France, Germany, and Canada, those remains could be repatriated first here to Madison with honors and then to Canada uh, for final burial, I believe in Saskatchewan. Uh, my colleague Josh Hyman gave a talk in March of 2015 on the forensic DNA background on this. And then in 2016, that was the first mission that I got to go on. This is looking for the remains of Lieutenant Frank Fazekas, who was shot down on May 27th of 1944, near the little town of Bousquier in the far north of France. Um, he was flying a P-47, that's a single seat fighter plane, pursuit plane, that's why they were called P's. We called them pursuit planes before we called them fighter planes. And this is gonna be an interesting comparison con and contrast because this was in a very flat ground, very deep soil, clay soil, no rock, I screened soil samples for 10 days and I don't think I ever saw a stone. Um, the team was able to find remains uh, both in 2016 and then later in the summer of 2017. They were identified and in uh, 2019, the remains of Lieutenant Fazekas were buried in Arlington National Cemetery. This is a tweet from August of 2021, but it's showing Ryan Wooben, who is the uh, team physician. He's an emergency room doctor and professor here. He's also a pilot. Uh, he flies in the helicopters. The uh, What's the name of the helicopters? The Med flight, thank you. Uh, and his undergraduate degree was in anthropology, archeology. span So it's a pretty amazing combination uh, to have that kind of skill. So this was 
the, the point I want to emphasize here is this was the first academic partnership between a university and the defense, the Department of Defense POW MIA accounting agency. And those are the, that's the agency within the Department of Defense responsible for finding, retrieving, tracking, identifying, repatriating remains of American MIAs. One of the, this picture shows one of the goals that many people on the team have, almost all of us, I think all of us, and that is to be able to put this little rosette right here next to the name of a missing in action person. So this is a memorial at the Ardennes American Cemetery in Belgium. And this was not where Frank Fazekas was buried because they, we didn't find his remains after the war. So he's among the several hundreds of people listed here. When remains are found and identified, then you get to put a rosette next to that name saying that person's remains have been found and in this case repatriated. So that little bitty rosette is a lot of work by a lot of people. And then in 2019, uh, Frank Fazekas's remains were buried here at the Arlington National Cemetery. I'm gonna draw your attention to the shape of the <clears throat> headstones here because uh, it's a little bit different than the American cemeteries in Europe. In 2018, they moved on to the third mission. Um, this was uh, intended to find the remains of Walter B. Stone, also a P-47 pilot. Um, they were able to excavate this site, which I didn't go to, so I can't say too much about it. This is Greg Jamison, who became the uh, lead archeologist on the digs. He was the lead archeologist this past summer also but you're gonna see some common denominators here. Here's a backhoe for digging, digging lots and lots of stuff out. Here's his trowel. Here's folks using shovels and buckets. Um, this is a process that takes a lot of people to be thorough and to find as much as possible. And you'll see more about this guy here. This is where I was stationed. They were able to find and identify remains of Walter Stone, and that's why this picture looks very similar to the one for Lieutenant Fazekas. Um, it's at the same place. It's about 10 yards down from Lieutenant Fazekas's. That's the Ardennes American Military Cemetery in Belgium. In 2019, uh, from the first time the team went on a recovery mission to Belgium. And this is the one that I worked on. So this is where I'll just say again, we were looking for one person who um, was not recovered of a bomber. And I won't say what kind of bomber it is because that would give you, it would be too much identification. You can know that it was a B-17 or B-24 or B-25 or B-26. One of the big differences, it was a bomber. That means there were many, many people in the crew, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11. Two people in this crew crashed with the plane and their remains were recovered by the Germans. That also means that maybe not all the remains were intact. So anything that we might find this in the summer of 2019 or this summer could have been from one of at least three crew members the person that we were looking for, or remains of the two people whose bodies were pulled from the wreckage. This sadly, of course, was, there's no June 27, 2020 pictures because of COVID. So for 2020 and 2021, the return to that site to finish it up was not possible. And this is from March of this year when it became clear that we were going to get to go back. And this is also alluding to this environmental DNA uh, initiative. 
So on June 26 of this year, I got to return to Basquiat in Northern France. I went on vacation with my family, my wife, Kristen, my daughter, Claire, my son, Will, and we were in France and I had to be in the Belgium airport at Zeventem uh, Monday morning, June 27th by 9.30, because that's when the rest of the crew was due to arrive from the United States. I'd been there since the 15th of June in France. Luckily, the drive, and we had a rental car, the drive meant we got to, I got to take my family to show them where I had spent about two weeks in 2016. And it so happened that when we drove up in this field behind here is, was where we uh, did the dig, there was a eyewitness called Monsieur Couche, who was 12 years old at the time. He is still alive. Um, but he was not able to talk to me that day. This is his son. And by the stroke of luck, as we were there, he and his wife came in and I introduced myself and reminded him that I had been there earlier. Um, these are very gracious people, very appreciative, long memory of, of uh, what Americans have done for France uh, in World War I and World War II. This, Monsieur Couche's grandfather served in World War I as most French males did. And I got to see his grandfather's uniform when I was there in 2016. Uh, you're never too far from a very present memory of two world wars. About a mile south of where we were standing when that picture was taken, this is the memorial in the churchyard. And it says uh, the commune of Boucher to uh, its sons who were killed for France, 1914, 1918. Down below is the names of the people killed in 1939 to 1945. And then there was this. So this says to Frank Fazekas, Lieutenant of the First uh, US Army Air Corps, pilot of a P-47. Those are all French and English words. Uh, shot down by the German army on the 27th of May near Bouchier, uh, at the pla place called Le Point du Jour. Uh, homage rendered on the 8th of May of 2018. From Bouchier, we went up to Dunkirk and got to take my kids to the mole, to the beach, to this memorial. Um, so that they have some context. They'd seen the movie that came out in 2017. Uh, this gave them a chance to see the real thing. So we stayed overnight in Dunkirk and then they drove me up to the airport and dropped me off. And then I was, they went back to France for more vacation and I was in Belgium. So a little bit of background about Belgium in World War II. Uh, Belgium was invaded on May 10th, 1940. Um, you'll probably recall that it also went through the Ardennes. The Germans went through the Ardennes and came around to the south and pinched off the English expedition, excuse me, the British expeditionary force. And that's why you ended up with this evacuation at Dunkirk. And September of 44, the Canadians on the left, the British in the center, and the Americans on the right came in and started invading, liberating uh, Luxembourg and Belgium. And there was bombing by the US and the British all along through those years. So if the Germans were there, the Americans, the British might bomb. And that means for me, I personally had to be conscious of the idea that um, the people of Belgium probably have memories of friends who got killed in the war and not necessarily by the Germans. That was certainly the case in Brest, France that my daughter and I visited. Um, and that's one place I got tuned into that. On December 16th, the Germans, uh, 
started this counterattack that everybody calls the Battle of the Ardennes, except for the Americans, we call it the Battle of the Bulge. And then starting on about December 22nd, 23rd was the first time that flights could fly again, the weather cleared up and there was a counterattack that lasted for a month. It was the bloodiest uh, battle from the US point of view of World War II. So the mission in 2019, put on hiatus in 2020 and 2021, and again this year, was to find remains or other physical evidence of an MIA crew member of an Army Air Force bomber shot down in the latter half of 1944. Um, I think I already covered this, so I'll just restate, we're looking for remains that were 78 years old. And any human remains we did find could possibly be from the person that we were looking for who was unaccounted, or they could be body parts from any of the two crew members whose bodies had been pulled from the wreckage by the Germans and buried. This is the crew this year. Um, this is the crew plus several other visitors, which I'll talk about in a little bit. It's about 17 people. And between having 17 people and perfect weather, we did not lose five minutes to rain. Yeah. That's called a heat wave and a drought, but it's ideal weather for doing the kind of work that we were doing. So now I'm gonna go through the team so that you get an idea of the work that Chuck here had to put, do to put together this team, because a lot of this doing archeology span is, it is the shovel and the trowel, but it's also the amount of work that it takes to get permission and the brain work that goes into figuring out where to look. So this is my boss, Chuck Konzinski. He's the associate director here. He started the program. Uh, it traces back to 2012. The program was officially launched in 2014. He's the guy that has to put the team together, get the expertise, talk to the different governments, get the permits, make sure the permits are okay, make sure the permits are okay, and make sure the permits are okay. Um, that includes working with the Department of Defense, in this case, the Belgian government and the local government and the landowners and the people that live on the land who may not be the landowners, <laughs> people nearby, the local community. That means finding local vendors, means finding a hotel that we could stay in. So it is a mountain of work. This is Greg Jamison. He's a professor at University of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Milwaukee. Um, he gave a talk a year and a half ago and we were doing it only by Zoom. Uh, he's the lead archeologist. So he's the guy with the archeological expertise. As he pointed out, remember we were coming over in COVID and people were wearing masks on the plane at least our folks were because we didn't want to get sick because if he got sick, the whole thing had to shut down. If I got sick, I just had to stay back at the hotel, <laughs> make sure the beer was cold. So this gentleman is pivotal to this and he's been an archeologist for 20 years, uh, 22 years and is the person that makes the final archeological scientific decisions. This is Brett Hoffman, also an archaeologist. He's with UW Oshkosh um, and teaches at the Fox Cities campus. Uh, he's part of the professional archaeological team also. This is Shaheen Christie. She's getting her PhD at UW Milwaukee. Um, and she's her specialty is that late Roman Britain mortuary practices. So she's the bone expert. So if anybody found anything that you thought might be a bone, you'd go to Shaheen and go, and she'd go. Except for maybe on one or two occasions. So it's a long, long time. And there are a lot of sticks that look identical to bones. I'm a plant person, I can tell you, oh my goodness, those sticks look a lot like bones, or at least what I thought would be a bone. 
She's also the forensic photographer for the project. And that's really important to be able to document, not with my cute little picture phone um, cameras, but with a real camera with the correct setup with the uh, rulers and perspective and all these things. This is Ella Axelrod. I got to work with her in 2016. She's a graduate student working with Bill Belcher, who was one of the professional archeologists in the 2016 dig. He's at the University of Nebraska Lincoln as is Ella. And um, she's standing next to this thing called the Life Science Life Support Investigation. Um, and so while 12 or 13 of us are out in the dig area, putting shoveling, soil into buckets, putting buckets onto the screens and shaking. She's the person who gets to look at all the things that we find. And she has to uh, assess what they may or may not be. The exception is this stuff called probative material, which could be biological, which could be bone or teeth or other tissues. Um, that goes directly to the archeologists. And then Ryan Woman, as I mentioned before, um, he did all the uh, pictures for the team, but he didn't take one of himself. So I'm showing you this. This is from 2016. And this is one of the two, actually this is two of the two machine guns we found. Machine guns are very powerful in this kind of archeology span because they're one of the few things that are really heavy, made out of iron, not out of steel, not out of aluminum. And they usually have a serial number attached to them. So when you find a machine gun, you get excited because there might be a serial number attached. To it. <laughs> and that's, you want, you want to make sure you have the right plane in a place where lots of people have had lots of planes go down. So that's Ryan. This is Finn Kennison. She's a grad student also at the University of Nebraska Lincoln. Um, and this is her second season. This is Tori Tiedemann. He's a UW-Madison alum from 2020. He worked for the program. He's now studying at uh, Columbia University, He's intending to go into medical school. And he's a veteran of the United States Marine Corps. He also likes to shovel. I liked to shovel when I was young. <laughs> this is Tristan Krauss. Uh, he's another UW-Madison alum who is now getting his PhD at Texas A&M. Um, and has been on digs before and has other experience through the Cranfield Forensic Institute. Um, and it's, it's great to have this team that has archeological, anthropological, veterans, history, pretty cool stuff. This is Theo Gier. Uh, he's Belgian undergrad going to school at the University of Namur. And he was one of our two translators, as well as he knows a lot about the area and he knows a lot about the people and he speaks like four different languages. This is uh, Lisa Mathieu, who is also an undergrad at the University of Namur, and she served as a translator also. And I can say from my exquisite mastery of French. It was great to have people who actually know how to speak French there. <laughs> this is Matt Campanen. Uh, he was in the 101st Airborne, which will come into play in a little bit. Uh, he's the state adjutant for the disabled American veterans here in Wisconsin. And uh, Airborne. This is David Green, he was uh, started off as enlisted, became an officer, a commissioned officer, retired as a major out of the army. And he's currently the adjutant for the VFW of Wisconsin. This is Carrie McAllen. She was in the army for 31 years, retired as a command sergeant major. Uh, for many years now, she's run a small family business here. And she's also with the VFW here in Wisconsin. This is Aaron Taylor. Uh, he's a professor 
of archaeology at St. Mary's University in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And what's pretty amazing about this is this underscores, Aaron's presence here underscores one of the major missions that Chuck sees for this program. And that is teaching undergrads and grad students, but also serving as a, a replica of, of an amplifiable model. In other words, can other universities do this? And the really good news is two thirds through our time on this dig, um, Aaron got the happy news that he will get his own dig this coming summer, about 90 kilometers west of Paris. I'm thinking that might be another thing I might want to try to help with. Um, this is a very large number for a country the size of Canada, about 33 million people, if I remember correctly. Uh, and that's because the Canadians, first of all, fought the entire time of both world wars, whereas the Americans came in in April of 1917, and we really didn't have many people on the ground till 1918. And uh, same thing with World War II, we didn't have any ground troops in Europe until April of 43 with the invasion of Sicily. Um, but the Canadians have been, were involved the entire time with both world wars. This is Mike McLaren. He retired as a Lieutenant Colonel from the US Army after a 29 year career. And he still works uh, as a civilian employee for the Department of Defense. And he lives in Florida and he helped with the Walter Stone um, retrieval. This is Major General Tim Zedalis. Uh, I've never met a two-star general before, and it was pretty nice. Uh, he lives in Elkhart Lake and is on our board, uh, or is on the board of advisors for the program. Um, and it's uh, pretty fascinating getting to listen to a person who flew all kinds of aircraft, commanded other people as they were flying all kinds of aircraft and uh, knows lots of history about the United States Air Force. Then there's me. <laughs> so, this is my little 4-H hat and my science expedition shirt. And this is the field that we worked. This is not the field that we worked, but this is the field of strawberries that I was thinking about having dreams forever. Um, this is the kind of food that we got to eat at the hotel that we stayed at. And I'll tell you where it is once we get to uh, permission to divulge that, because you would want to go there. They're great people with wonderful food and fantastic hospitality. This is the long table that we had breakfast at and dinner at every day, um, and some days lunch. And the camaraderie of this is a key point of keeping people going from June 27th to July 19th. It's a long time. So we arrived in Belgium on Monday, June 27th. We drove through the rain and it was horrible rain. I thought, oh my goodness, we were gonna get sogged in. We'll be knee deep in mud. It was the last rain we had. We got to our location and Tuesday, uh, June 28th was our first briefing. And I wanna show you, this is the great place that the hotel has for us to gather. So uh, this is Chuck and Eliza, and we're listening to uh, Greg speak and I'm sitting here taking notes. This is my notebook. These are the vans that we took from the hotel every day. There are two vans like this, plus a third car. Uh, so it's pretty much like seven and eight, seven and eight, three and four. And this is the courtesy that the hotel owners extended to us, uh, flying the United States flag and flying the POW MIA flag the whole time that we were there. One of the things that is really important in keeping up morale besides ice cream and strawberries, um, is getting to stop at the Smatch about every other, every third day. And 
this is uh, where we would get our water and our snacks and make sure that if you're going to be there from eight o'clock in the morning till five o'clock at night. Every time you had a, a break at 10 minutes to the hour, you had something to eat or drink. And this is the road that leads to the site. Um, this is actually taken from the site, excuse me. This is looking south from the site. Um, two or three different types of grain. I couldn't tell for sure what it was. It was not oats, but it was uh, wheat or barley or triticale. Um, and then a forage crop. And we got to watch this from June 27th to July 15th. This is what I think was the wheat field. This is how different it was from 2016. There were no trees on the site at 2016. It was a perfectly flat Flanders field, clay soil as deep as we cared to dig. And they dug the second year in 2017, 15 feet down. Here we have these spruce trees planted as a plantation. Um, back here is the meadow that we were gonna excavate the crash happened in here, so we were going to be um, excavating both meadow, a hillside, and the forest. And this is what greeted us. They took the time to spell out in English, welcome. And I was very appreciative of that. This is what the site looked like. This had been dug up in 2019, but over the summers of 2020 and 2021, uh, the meadow had reestablished. So getting here, we had to find the original stake left in the ground. That's the point of beginning for um, surveying and then knock down the weeds and everything. This is another part of the logistics, uh, working with the DPAA. Uh, we have this storage container dropped off at the, where the road meets the uh, track to the site. And this has got all this cool stuff in it. And I'll go through what it is. For some reason, this is called a bicon. I don't know why it's called a bicon, but the idea was you got to run up to the bicon. Um, they didn't have any Snickers bars in the bicon, but otherwise they had about everything else. One of the things that we had to do in the first day or two was to build the life science, uh, life support investigation station. Um, so that took some carpentry and this is Ella and Aaron and Eliza um, and Finn gearing up to take stuff from these buckets and place them on the screen and start assessing them for their usefulness. This is the machine that I ran. Oh my goodness, am I good at this? Uh, these are just some four by fours with some pipe through them. And then you use engineering tape to put these uh, shaker screens on them. And this is how you use them. Uh, usually you don't have front and back, but this picture was such a good one of uh, David and Chuck that I used it. Um, very simple design, unbelievably pleasant to work with. It swings back and forth. It shakes as long as you don't have any rain. Did we have any rain? We didn't have any rain. The other thing you're seeing there is that is more rocks than I ever saw in the whole 10 days that I worked in France. And that would be every bucket. One of the big differences was that this was um, over shale. The soil was only a foot or two deep. That means whatever time of year this aircraft hit the ground, it probably splintered because there was no clay to go 10, 12, 15 feet into, or certainly not like there was at uh, in France. That meant every bucket was a lot of stone. It also meant it made it harder to find things that looked like bone, or at least for a guy like me with untrained eyes. This is a picture from the department, from the DPAA, and I've never seen stuff come out like this, and I'm so envious, but that is what it looks like when you get one, two, three, four, five, and six people going there. 
Uh, it's the same design. This is the bucket that you throw anything in that you find that's of interest. Here we are looking at uh, the trees, trying to figure out which trees got to get cut down. We did not have to have a chainsaw. We did not have to cut any trees in France. Um, it's fun watching grown men who really love to run chainsaws, run chainsaws. This is uh, using the GPS to locate uh, prior markers from 2019. So I think this is Finn and Ella. Um, so when you think about what kind of tools you got to have with you, some of them are simple as shovels, some are GPS, other things in between. So here's Brett using the tape uh, to measure out the plots um, that we will be digging up in squares. This is from last summer, but it's this new version of a fabricated out of metal shaker table, screening table. And it's a very colorful and uh, cool thing. And we brought that along. Again, this is part of what we're doing is, as a university, we're trying to help test new ways that might be better than the old ways for doing things. This is how it came with the, the company here in Wisconsin that fabricated it, has it all labeled so that you can put it together. Um, and it's in small enough uh, units that you can take it with you on the plane if you want to pay for the extra weight. It can also go in the back of a small car. These are the implements that I used um, on occasion because you can tell they're the most complicated ones. Uh, loppers, wow, we use loppers a lot because we were digging in the trees and these trees are probably 80 years old or close to it, no, 70 years old. Um, so here's this very nice uh, Fisker's shovel, the classic, um, European type shovel here that's different than our spade. Um, and up here is the most important thing is the bucket and the tape measure. Is that about everything? Pick, lappers, shovels of different flavors, buckets. And then the classic trowel and dustbin. So we've got to set up a place for use every day. And this is important because we were planning on rain, especially since it rained very heavily our first day when we drove from Brussels to near Bastogne, and then it never rained. But this was great to have shade and a place to eat and a place to have breaks. And this is one another thing about the camaraderie is um, every hour, 10 minutes to the top of the hour, Chuck called break. And when you're doing tedious, monotonous, repetitive work, you kind of look forward to that. It's not only physically, but it's the mental sharpness that you got to maintain. After all, you're looking literally for a needle in a haystack. And if you're mentally groggy, it can go right by you and you don't want to do that. So um, figuring out how to maintain morale, um, giving people breaks, making watching how they're dealing with the heat um, is all part of this. Now I'm showing this because this is in Belgium, and you know that the most famous battle fought in Belgium most likely is the Battle of Waterloo. And how do you pronounce this in French? Louis moi. So this is like water Louis moi, please. I think it literally means rent me. Um, and uh, it's nice to have two of them. And then you get inside and you see, wow, it's a little bit slice of home there because it's from Minneapolis. <laughs> so day two, we, those are some pictures from day one in the field. Day two in the field, we had um, uh, planning on four days to have the excavator come. And day two in the field was going to be the first day to excavate. And the big thing about this that's different than, you know, like if you're going to be excavating at Herculaneum or Pompeii or going down millimeter by millimeter is how you do it here. Well, th this is archaeology that's recovery archaeology, not um, to figure out how things, how humans worked in 
Uh, so we're needing to go through lots and lots of dirt. So the backhaul crawler comes, there's the backhaul crawler, there's the driver's van. This shows how we arrived every day. And then the tarps. The tarps are really important because when you go and dig up with that crawler, you put them on the tarp, you get a big pile, you get two or three folks with a shovel, and then you put the, you shovel all that dirt that the excavator dug up over the next three or four days. That's what you go through, bucket by bucket by bucket. This is a one by two meter square that Aaron had plotted out and asked the excavator to start digging. This is in the meadow. I'm where I'm standing when I took this picture was right by the trees. This is our first one of our first breaks. Back to work, and you can see they have these flags in their hands, and Teo here has got his metal detector. And the metal detector is really helpful because you want to work where most metal is. You're going with the idea that you're more likely to find remains where you're finding metallic remains also, human remains. So finding those places and marking them is part of what Teo um, and Elisa and uh, could do because that was part of their training as archaeology students. And this is the type of pile of dirt that we would have to go through sitting on that tarp. In the background, you see the setup for the shaker tables. And here's Aliza taking notes. Shaheen's taking notes and taking pictures. This is the metal detector. So systematically over the coming two and a half weeks, we went and worked this way and down that hill, excuse me, this way and down this hill here and into the uh, woods. This shows you how shallow it is. This is not a place at all like I was used to from 2016 where you could just dig and dig and dig and dig. And there's a reason that you didn't have trench warfare in this part of Belgium, but you did in Flanders. And it's because you can't dig through this very easily. And if you have a chainsaw and you use it, you likely have to service it. So this is Matt working on the chainsaw. And then this is a good chunk of what we did for many days. Uh, this is Ryan and Matt operating the shovel and the buckets. And then you carry the buckets to here and you put the bucket onto the shaker table and you shake it through and you have gloves on your hand because one of the things you might get is some barbed wire. There's a lot of barbed wire in this stuff. And there's other pieces of metal. And so you'll see Finn has gloves on. Um, and so you're going through all this stuff. If you find anything, you put it in this bucket. And that's the whole nine yards right there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine plus me taking pictures. The other folks are out doing measurements or working the uh, analysis table. There are uglier places that I have worked outdoors in this. It was a fantastic view. Now in here, this is how you, you keep all this stuff straight. You put a piece of paper in there that says uh, the date, the unit number, the depth, uh, probably the macker, the missing air crew report. Um, and this is the kind of stuff that we've got. Some barbed wire, some 50 caliber bullets, a bunch of aircraft wreckage. Mm -hmm. Anything that's found in here that's useful gets bagged with that information from that piece of paper. Anytime we shifted from one rectangle, whether it was one by one, two by two, one by two, what did we have to do? Had to put a new, make sure the new set of cards was in there because these buckets are the way that you can ensure the provenience, which is a word new to me. It's like provenance, only difference. Provenience is knowing the location, which unit, 
which day and which depth um, that you got a item from. This is Ella working that life support investigation station. And she went through all these different things that we found and had to assess them. I would like you to estimate how many hundred uh, pieces that she assessed over the 18, 19 days that we were there. And if I told you 11,000, I would be telling you the truth. And that's the second summer of 11,000 pieces. 2019 was also 11,000. So this is a lot of work, a lot of judgment, a lot of sifting and winnowing, mostly throwing stuff away. Um, so when she does find something that's of interest, that could be probative, in other words, could this help us identify the, are they remains and can they help us identify, or is it something that could identify the plane for sure? Uh, those are the two things that we're really most interested in. And this is Ella talking with a visitor. So we worked Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. We took Sunday off and went to Bastogne. If I have time, I'll show you some pictures of that. Then we worked Monday, the 4th of July, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We had perfect weather, which meant we were ahead of schedule and we started shifting to work in the woods. So here's Greg giving us a briefing. Um, and this was one of the tweets that went out. So here's the meadow transition to the grass, to the trees. Working in the trees is different. You're not in the sun, you're in the shade, but working through digging in ground, that's all these roots. Oof. And we rarely went more than a foot deep, but it took forever to do that because you had to lop and chop and still sift through all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Wanted to point out that this being the 4th of July, um, the folks at the hotel also through a cookout for us to celebrate the day that we celebrate, which I thought was gracious and typical of their warm hospitality. So now this is showing what a forensic photographer is gonna be doing on a site like this with the stakes, uh, showing scale and direction and taking pictures um, with a high-end camera. This is what it's like to dig in the woods. So you line all these things up, you get ahead because it takes forever to dig. And we can go through, the, the bucket brigade can go through it faster than they can dig. And this is what the shaker stations look like. This is a pretty steep hill. I, I would say it was 20% grade. Um, walking down, it was a chore walking up even harder. Then we had another day or two with the excavator. They have to come back and put things back. They also get to dig stuff. And I don't know if you can make this out or not, but this was a very exciting day uh, because somebody found this. And I don't know if you can see what this thing is. It looks like a quarter coin. That is a 50 caliber machine gun bullet in the breach of a 50 caliber machine gun from the plane that went down. So this was very exciting. Why? Again, machine guns are one of the few things that have likely have serial numbers on them. So now we're going to excavate this out. They went very carefully. They strung it up, dug by hand took pictures with scale, and you can see how much it took to get down in here. Again, if this were France, there wouldn't be any stones here. This would just all be clay. I shouldn't say France. If this were the site of Bousquier, it would all be clay. And this machine gun was missing the last half foot, last six inches, last 30 centimeters, no, 20 centimeters of the breach. It did not have any, we could not find the serial number on it. So here we are in week three, as we're finish, finishing up, we went through 360 cubic meters of soil that was 
dug either by hand or by the excavator, shoveled into buckets and screened. 360 meters is one meter this way, one meter this way, and 360 meters that way. Or two meters this way, one meter high and 180. Or it's a lot. I was stunned. Again, we had 11,000 pieces of aircraft wreckage found and assessed. Most of it was tossed. The physical evidence was logged, photographed, and then sent to DPAA for analysis, um, as it was also shared with the uh, Belgian police. The excavator back filled the holes, and we had to return the Bicon for the next mission, which could be later in the summer. Um, somebody else might be doing it. So this is what I did almost the whole time because younger guys like shoveling and <laughs> I love shoveling and somebody else is doing it. Also on July 12th, we had the great honor of having uh, Ambassador Tom Barrett, a, a former mayor of the city of Milwaukee, former member of the House of Representatives, uh, now ambassador to Luxembourg, not Belgium, but Luxembourg. And uh, we we're delighted to welcome him and his group of folks to come and visit. Um, he's very tuned to how Luxembourg citizens view World War I and World War II and the roles that the Allies played in it. And uh, he was there to express his appreciation. He's also a UW alum, as it points out. So this is the buckets and buckets and buckets of aircraft wreckage, each piece counted. And if it wasn't helpful to identifying, it basically got put back in the ground. And this is what it looks like. Um, there were a few larger pieces, but not many. One of the reasons for that is that this is a highly looted site. And by highly looted, the archeologists mean the Germans came and pulled stuff off. Locals came and pulled stuff off. Um, it's not like it was an unknown thing. There was an eyewitness for this one, also about a 12 year old boy. It's very similar to what happened uh, in France. Um, so people knew that this went down. And uh, so over the years, any large pieces on the surface were probably uh, taken. And then this is uh, what it looks like when you take everything apart and you leave it for your friends. Now, as with the first three recovery missions, we have to wait. We now, the samples that are sent to the DPAA, which are included some possible bone material, we have to wait to see if they can confirm that they're human bone, confirm that they can get some DNA out of them. And then if they can run the PCR and uh, the DNA fingerprinting and get a match. Um, that will take at least a year if the other two previous ones are any judge. So hopefully we'll be able to give you an update in a little while about that. Um, so this says to our victims, civil and military, 1066 and all that, this is French that most of us can read. 1914, 1918, 1940 to 1945. And down here's the thing that I thought was pretty impressive. In 1995, they said 50 years of peace, thank you. And of course that was 1995, we're much closer to 80 years of peace now. So the mission in context, we, on our days off, we also went to these places, Bastogne, Luxembourg City, Arlon, and Ardennes. Um, this is the city plaza um, place, McAuliffe, who was the commanding general of the 101st Airborne in mid-December at Bastogne at, during the Battle of the Bulge. This is an American tank, and this is what a German shell can do to it. You may have heard of the Band of Brothers, uh, both the book and uh, by UW Madison alum, Stephen Ambrose. Uh, then there was the movie, the TV series uh, that came out 20 years ago now. 
this is one of the actors in it and he was leading he was part of a group of tourists and somebody recognized him uh, while we were dining lunch at Le Nuts. and if you know the Bastogne story you know that when uh, General McAuliffe received the call for surrender from the Germans he sent back one word and that was nuts <laughs> uh, so this is a restaurant on the square that's caters to Americans. So this is uh, many of our team here taking a picture with that actor. This is a memorial to the Belgian fighters um, at the Bastogne, one of the three Bastogne museums that we went to. Uh, to our dead, 1418, 40, 45, glory to our dead. Um, as an American, I think it's really important to realize um, many Americans fought and died there. We went to many cemeteries. Well, we went to two cemeteries of Americans and a third cemetery of Germans. Um, I'm pretty sure there are many Belgian cemeteries with Belgian dead. This is from the museum, and this gives you a, a reminder of the types of planes that we were possibly looking for. So the B-25, uh, the B-24, I don't see the B-17 or the B-26. This is the one, the type that uh, Physicus and Stone were in. I threw this in because, hey, Wisconsin Dells. And uh, we think of these as really important during maritime invasions, but they are also equally important in crossing rivers like the Rhine or the Meuse. And uh, it was great to see one like this in such excellent shape. Um, this is another Bastogne War Museum on the edge of town. Uh, and this was rather sobering. I'll try to read the French. Um, it says, notice uh, the head commander of Brussels uh, communicates the following. On the night of the 16th of December, 1941, uh, criminal uh, put against the face of the military basement, military building, um, a device that when it explode would, uh, although, excuse me, it failed to explode, um, would have caused great damage. If anybody's French is better than mine, let me know. <laughs> Um, three more uh, transformers were sabotaged on the night of the 15th to the 16th. The entire population is invited to aid in the discovery of the authors of these attacks, these criminal attacks, and to let us know immediately all information that would help us in their arrest uh, by coming to a bureau of the Belgian police or to a German army space. If the, if the guilty folks are not discovered by the 27th of December at no. noon, thank you, a certain number of Belgians who have already committed acts of sabotage will be gathered together uh, and shot. Um, not like anything I've had to read in English in the United States in my lifetime. I don't think we're immune to that. Um, we certainly had grievous war crimes in this country, but not real recently. Oh, I'm going the wrong direction. And then I think I'll, uh, let's see now. I want to show one last thing. This is what the news looked like on December 29th of 1944, if you were reading the New York Times. And this is something that I think is gonna be lost when we don't have newspapers anymore, or most people are looking at websites. The above the fold, the number of stories above the fold and the breadth of the war is breathtaking. This is showing the Battle of the Bulge here. And this is being the salient, the salient that the British would call it. We called it the bulge because, hey, you know, 
three syllables or one. Um, but look at all the different places that this that this war is impacting. I'm showing this one because this is Stars and Stripes. And I think it's one of the earliest, if not the earliest, to call it the bulge. And this is why I think Americans call it the Battle of the Bulge, while the British and the Belgians and the French and the Luxembourgers call it the Battle of the Ardennes. This is the 101st Airborne Museum. That was the third museum that we visited in English. Everybody in Luxembourg speaks English anyway, but this is to acknowledge uh, the fact that these were Americans and if it had been further north and further west, it would have been British and Canadians. And this is not the first time the Americans had come to Luxembourg. This is the American, the Luxembourg American Cemetery. This is the monument that uh, was built. Uh, this is the, for lack of a better word, this is a chapel or memorial. Um, these are the religious symbols that are there. And then this is the woman who gave us the tour, especially when she found out what we were doing. She gave us a super deluxe tour. And she was telling us about um, not only the people who were buried there, but also the system in which they buried the dead. And I, um, one of the things that's different here is if you remember Lieutenant Fazekas's headstone, what did it look like? So if you go to Norm, if you go to Normandy, you see these things. If you go to Ardennes, you see the crosses. If you go to here at Luxembourg City, you see the crosses. If you go to our to Arlington or to the National Cemetery in Milwaukee, you don't see that. And this is very interesting because uh, you see here mostly, mostly crosses. The flag is at half staff because this was the Sunday after former Prime Minister Abe of Japan was assassinated. And I think what it means that an American cemetery, an American military cemetery from World War II lowered the flag to half staff to recognize the assassination of a, Jap a former Japanese prime minister. There is hope for the world. So one of the things that is um, problematic about shifting from the Arlington type headstone to this is what do you do about people who aren't Christian? So there are two types of headstones here, uh, the cross and then the Star of David. And when in, the woman that gave us the tour told us um, the story that American soldiers, when they were filling out the information that was gonna be on their dog tag, had three options when it came to religion, Protestant, Catholic, or Jewish. And I'm going like, wow, what happened to all the others? And there was no other. Now she's telling the story um, at, at a previous picture that right now they're working on trying to identify people who checked Christian, but were actually practicing Jews. Why would you do that? Well, if you knew you were going to Europe, and you might be taken prisoner, and you're obliged to give them your dog tags, you may not want to have Jewish on your dog tag. So now the folks that run these cemeteries are going through a, a kind of sleuth project, like not, on, not dissimilar from what we're doing, is trying to find uh, people who were practicing Jews, but ticked that box for Christian, and then if, that's, if they can get sufficient evidence, they will put in a new headstone with a star David. This is the headstone of Nancy Leo. She's the only woman buried at the Luxembourg Cemetery, American Cemetery in Luxembourg. 
And you'll see the date that she died was July 24th of 1945. So that's two, three months after the end of hostilities. She died in a car wreck. She was driving in a car to go meet up with her sister who was also a nurse. Of course, she never arrived. Um, so there are people here that are buried. Uh, if you died before the end of 1945 and you were in the military, you were qualified to be buried here. And somebody who meets that, um, this is the picture of uh, Nancy Leo. So I got ahead of myself. This is uh, the guide telling us about this gentleman here um, who was this new marker had just been placed in the last few weeks. So somebody like Nancy Leo who survived the war and was killed in a car wreck but died before the end of 1945 was George Patton. And he's buried here uh, all apart from everybody else and his letters are in black so that you can read them. Um, <laughs> let me go back here. That was, so this is uh, a story unto itself. If you get to go to Luxembourg, go hear the story of how they decided to bury George Patton in a special place. Uh, this is another reason that I wanted to go back to Luxembourg City. I stumbled on this in 1986, my first time there, and I was astonished to see my family name up on the wall. This says in French, to the memory of J. Antoine Zinnen, composer of the national hymn, Our Homeland, 1827 to 1898. And I was delighted from 1986 to 2022 20, to be able to go back and find it um, in Luxembourg City. Before we left Luxembourg City, we also went to see the Deutsch, the German soldier cemetery. And I think I'll go through these and, and there. Um, very different approach. You go through this dark, dark, dark hallway. There are trees, the lawn is not manicured. There are these crosses, you do not get your own Headstone, you share it with four other people. And this late in the war, look at the ages here. So from the 29th of November of 07 to the uh, 3rd of February of 45, that person was 38 years old or so. So a lot of these were either very young or very old. This is the story of how their war graves came to be. There are 5,286 there. Uh, in 150 locations, and then they combined them all into uh, this site, which now has 10,900. The dead in this cemetery admonished to peace. This is one and a half kilometers a mile from uh, where Patton is buried. Okay, so it's late and I will stop there. Thank you very much for listening to my little travel log. Um, I'd be happy to take questions. If that plane hit such stony soil, is there any expectation that it would have penetrated the first shaley layers at all? If that plane hit such shaley rocky soil, is there any expectation that it would penetrate it? I don't think so. We did not dig real deep. We, we never had to carved steps in the side the way we did in France. There were no ladders. There was no, nothing about having to 
carved back embankments because we got deep. It was never more than three feet deep. That my memory is the machine gun picture that I showed you was as deep a hole as we dug. That machine gun also made me think, holy cow, that's an amazing amount of speed coming in for that to spear its way into the soil, into the rock. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed it. Oh, I like to say that. Yeah, I noticed it in the capsule biography of the Canadian member of your team. It said something about a field school that he ran in Cuba. You know anything about that? Yeah, Canadians get to go to Cuba <laughs> and work there. And I don't know anything about what he was, what kind of archaeology he was doing there. Um, but that's a very distinct uh, difference. I don't know of any Americans who any longer are going to Cuba to do field work. Doesn't mean that doesn't happen. I just don't know about it. And it was routine for a Canadian to be able to do that. For the site that was excavated on this trip, you have left markers knowing where the excavation has been done, I presume. Is there an area that will be excavated later adjacent to where excavation has been finished? They leave the prime post in the ground so that a surveyor could come in and they've got a detailed map. And that map's deposited with the Department of Defense and with the Belgian police. So that if somebody wanted to come back in future years with the map and a metal detector to find the metal post that's in the ground, they could go back and find those places. However, this is the second full summer of digging. Um, and I haven't heard any indication that they intend to go back there. I think the idea is um, it might be better, our work and efforts might be better looking at a new site that hasn't been excavated yet. We return to the dogs and eggs. They were C for E for Protestant, C for Catholic, and H for Hebrew. Wow. Okay, didn't know that. Um, I will say that the power of the movie Saving Private Ryan is significant. I remember a time before Saving Private Ryan was a thing. But once it came out, that became a, a dominant way that Americans remember World War II and revere the folks that fought in it. And I can't remember the name of the Jewish soldier, but he held his dog tag up and said, Jew, uh, Juden, Juden. Um, and so he must have checked the H box. There's going to be a fundraiser for this project uh, this on September 17th. If you go to the UWMIA website, you can find information about it. Um, if you're interested in uh, participating in that, it's going to be a motorcycle ride to several bars around Wisconsin, around this area. So. Uh, I hope you'll consider checking that out. And the other thing is, uh, as is usual, we go to the library afterwards. Uh, tonight is my last day of my 65th year. At midnight, I turn 65 and start my 66th birthday. So I will buy. Yeah, it's going to be, because Tom's going to get me a, a Diet Pepsi. Thank you all very much for coming tonight. I hope to see you next week for Anna Caroline Paiva Gandara and her work on climate change and the consequences of suboptimal temperatures on